it's our second to the last sermon on uh, Nehemiah. And so we're winding up the book, which has been a fun journey. Uh, our series has been called Nehemiah the Journey. Uh, many of us in this service are, are expats, and so we're here as part of our life's journey. As God takes us different places, um, but, um, but we are super glad that you're here uh, with us this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it, to Nehemiah chapter 11, as we begin. We're excited about all that's happening. More than that, we're excited that God is forming us into a people, because the church is more than just uh, an organization is more than just a location. Church is not a building. It's not a crowd. It's not an event. But it's a people who are called together for a purpose. And that purpose always has to do with the presence of God. And so that's what church is. is. It's a people called by God to come together to carry out his purposes for that specific group of people. And so we as every nation, Taipei, we're here called by God for a purpose. Just like when, when Nehemiah went to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, it was more than just about putting up walls and creating a place. It was about the people that were going to live within those walls because God always had a purpose for Jerusalem as a city. And today we're going to look at what does that look like? What, is, what does it mean to be the people of God in a place? And how does God form that? And we're going to apply that to our lives and, and our journey as a church. What is God saying to us? What is he doing in our lives? Because the goal of us is, for us is not to become you know, experts in history and understand all there is to know about the history of Jerusalem. The goal is not to just have some theological knowledge of, uh, of, of understanding um, the facts of the Bible. But it's really to apply it to our lives. That our lives can be transformed by what's written in what we believe to be the Word of God. And that God would speak to us not just individually, that's great. I love quiet time with God. I love the moments that we spend just alone with God. I think in the month of August, Darren's going to do a, a, a workshop on, on just encountering God in your quiet time. But God says it's, it's, it's more than just us and God individually. But it's also us and God. Because God calls us together. He puts the solitary into families. And so I love how like Jordan and Anna said, we found a home. You know, we found the place. We want to dedicate our kid here because this is a family. This is a people called together. So how do we become the people of God? Nehemiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It says, the leaders of the people were living in Jerusalem, the holy city. A tenth of the people from the other um, towns of Judah and Benjamin were chosen by sacred lots to live there too, while the rest stayed where they were. And the people commended everyone who volunteered to resettle in Jerusalem. So we see here, Jerusalem. It's, it's interesting, when you go back to here, it says, the leaders of the people were living in Jerusalem, the holy city. And that's how God viewed Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is the holy city. And if you were here with us at the beginning of the year, uh, every nation as a, a worldwide uh, family of churches, we took seven days uh, to uh, set apart at the beginning of the years and just to fast and to pray together and to seek God. And the theme this year was, was set apart. What it means to be holy to God. That, that word holy, the holy city, means it's a city that's set apart from every other purpose and set apart for God's purposes. And so Jerusalem was called by God the holy city. And, and this place, this passage of scripture is actually the very first time in the Bible that God uses that terminology, Jerusalem, the holy city. And so as you begin to read the word, and some of you are going to be like just students of theology and love to study and unpack the word. There's a principle in studying the word of God and in theological studies. It's called the principle of first mention. And the first time that anything is mentioned in the scriptures, it usually has a special significance. And there's a lot about the nature of that, of whatever it, is, whatever it is that is being mentioned, whether it's the first time that family is mentioned, or the first time that sin is mentioned, or the first time that bread is mentioned, or the first time that a person is mentioned in the Bible. That, very, that first mention 
often has in that instance or in, the, in those circumstances, in that passage of Scripture, will, will unpack for us a deeper meaning of that item that's being mentioned. And so here we're going to see Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is actually, throughout the Scriptures, it's referred to as, as a special place, a special geographical location on earth. And there's a reason why. So we're going to unpack why is Jerusalem, the holy city, set apart? What is it set apart from and what is it set apart to? And how does that relate to us as the church? Jerusalem, the holy city, okay? Here we see, actually, we go to the end. We're going to look at the very first mention of Jerusalem, the holy city. And then at the end of the Bible, Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the second to the last chapter, it talks again about the new Jerusalem. And so we see Jerusalem, we're going to look at the bookends of the first mention of Jerusalem and the last mention. And in that then we can begin to see and unpack what is, what is God referring to when he talks about Jerusalem and how does that apply to us. And so in Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 and 2 it says, um, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And also the sea, the sea was also gone. And so what, what that means is this physical creation as we know it now, it's going to come to an end. There's a beginning and an end to this physical creation as we know it. But then it says this, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So we see Jerusalem, the holy city, in the book of Nehemiah, and we see the new Jerusalem, again, the holy city, coming down from heaven. And we're going to unpack, what does that mean? What does Jerusalem represent for us at the beginning of the first mention to the very end? Because when all of creation, and all of God's purposes, purposes culminate, it's going to culminate in the new Jerusalem. And so when we think about those of you who are Bible scholars and you think about and you've read through the whole Bible, you know that human history in the scriptures begins in a garden, the Garden of Eden, which is beautiful. We love How many of you love gardens? I love gardens. We live right by Taipei Botanical Garden. And I love that we, we have a 15-minute walk to the, to the subway, um, to the MRT. But I love that it goes right through the Botanical Garden. Because there's just something about a garden that's it's restful, it's peaceful, it's beautiful, it's, it's renewing and refreshing to go through that. But history doesn't end there. Human history starts in a garden, but it ends in a city. And there's a reason why that's true. Because all of culture and, and the values of humanity actually flow from the city. And as the city, the concept of the city has developed over time in humanity, it's begun to bring people together, and it has accelerated the progress of humanity. So many great different cultural values, so many different cultural um, di discoveries and, uh, have happened in the city. And my wife and I lived in New York City, which by any, any measure is one of the, the leading cities in terms of forming the, the cultures and the values of different generations. People look to this, New York City, the Big Apple. If I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere, you know. Um, but so many of the trends that we see, the things that we value from generation to generation, start, are birthed in a city. So I love the parks, and I, I, and I love little villages, and, and we spent the, um, a, a, a few days a couple of weeks ago up in the mountains uh, by Hualin. It's beautiful, and it's restful, and we're in a little town. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, right but Ruiswe, is that how we pronounce the word? Ruiswe? I got it right? All right. Huh? Fourth tone. <laughs> Ruiswe. Is that right? Okay. Getting there close. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm learning little by little, very slowly. Yeah. And my wife says, me too. Um, but, you know, it's a beautiful time. We loved it, you know, eating there and going up and seeing all the beauty there. But you rarely hear uh, of, of fads or fashions or viral stuff or trends in society coming from Riceway. Even though we like going there. We hear it coming from New York or here in, in, in Taiwan, Taipei. So many of the, 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 the cultural trends would be birthed out of here. 
and people will follow. What's happening in Taipei? What are people wearing there? How do people act there? What's the vocabulary? And so people in, in the States where I come from, it's like places like LA and places like New York. And that's true of around the world, whether it's London or Seoul or Tokyo, these big cities are where culture is, flows down, it flows from the cities. And so all of, so all of, all of creation, God's plan for humanity ends in a city. So we're looking at this, the, the new Jerusalem, God's holy city, chosen by God, the culmination of all of his plans, says that the, the leaders of the people, so going back to, to Nehemiah chapter one, says the leaders of the people were living in Jerusalem, the holy city, and a tenth of the people from the other cities of Judah and Benjamin were chosen by sacred lots. And sacred lots are simply like, like how we roll dice or draw straws. It's a way of choosing. And so they would have in those days, sacred lots often were like a, a bag full of stones and all the, the bags have a different mark and they decide, okay, whoever chooses the stone with this mark on it, you're the one who's selected. And that would be how they would often yeah, make decisions. But in those days, they also, God would, would use sacred lots, like throwing the dice and saying, okay, whoever, if you rolls a seven, that you're the one who's chosen. Uh, and so they would use these sacred lots to, to, to figure out direction from God and choosings by God. And, and why did they have to roll the sacred lots? It was because people didn't want to go to Jerusalem. And the leaders were there, but the people didn't want to go to Jerusalem. In fact, it says, the people com commended everyone who volunteered to resettle in Jerusalem. Why did they commend them? Because it's like, you're making this huge sacrifice. Thank you for being willing to sacrifice your life and do what none of the rest of us want to do. It wasn't like, wow, great, you know, you won the prize. It was kind of like, Great, yeah, I'm glad it's you and not me. You know, I'm so glad you're so proud and willing to sacrifice the future you used to have by moving to Jerusalem, which is like, you know, just the, 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 where nobody wants to go. So Jerusalem was the holy city, but it was also the despised city. And it's interesting how cities, places, and people can be both honored and despised depending on your point of view. So from God's point of view, Jerusalem was the, cho the holy city the chosen city, set apart for his purposes. But for the people around Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the despised city, the place nobody really wanted to go. And if you want to live, live there, well, good luck to you. And we see that in our generation today. For some churches, home, it's family. And like David said, I was so glad when they said, hey, let's go to church today. For others, it's like church. Why are you wasting time doing that? That's, you know, that's from a past generation. That's obsolete. Jerusalem, the holy city, the despised city. So how do we become this, this people of God? You know, choosing to, to, to follow God and to become the people of God, it's not always a popular choice. It's not what everyone wants to do. In... Um, as we've gone through this, for us, this, this move that we're in, this transition in our journey to a new location as they get ready to tear this building down, it hasn't been an easy journey. Our, our property search team, Mark and his team, have looked at place after place after place, and um, Mark and Kenny have, you know, said, oh, we found this new place, and it looks really good, and we go there, and we start looking at it, and we're saying, oh, that wall is falling down, or, you know, the, the previous tenant said, you don't want to be here, or there's only one small elevator, and it's up on the fourth floor, so 100 people trying to get in and out, maybe not, you know, and, and so just place after place just didn't work out, didn't pan out, and there were times of frustration, there were times of wondering when it got to, like, we're a month away, we're like, oh, okay, God, uh, we know you're going to come through, but we're wondering when, and we don't know why God always clicks to wait till the last moment, you know, <laughs> I'm sure the children of Israel had that same idea going through the wilderness. Hey, there's no water here. We, we thank you for the cloud, or the pillar of cloud during the day and the fire night, but it led us to some place where there's no water and it led us to a place where there's no food. And why did you bring us here, God? I tell you what, if, if you are going to follow God, that's going to happen to you too. Because it's the only way we learn to trust God. And it's the only way that God can lead us Oftentimes, to the places we need to get there. I, I love this show on TV. It's called uh, Bear Grylls. Um, and, and, and I forget the, what, what's the name of it, Untamed Wild Places or something like that. Uh, but he takes these celebrities 
and he goes on these treks through the wilderness. I love that, BBC. Uh, and if there's an easy way to go, he's always going to take the hard way. We're going to have to jump off this cliff and swim through this freezing cold river, and we're going to have to eat worms and a dead piece of of, of a killed snake that we found, you know, we'll just wipe out the mag, take out the maggots and then we'll cook it. It'll be okay. You know, um, you know, we got some elephant poop and, and there's good nutrition in that. So we'll just boil it and then we'll drink it. It's going to be really good. You know, you're like, <sighs> you know, but by the end of the journey that every celebrity is like, man, I learned so much about myself. I really grew in, in this thing. I, I just, what an amazing adventure because that's how we grow. Not just on Bear grills, but you know, in life. Actually, we're built for that. We're built for adventure. But so many of us, we, we tend to want to just live ordinary, comfortable lives, and we miss out on the adventure that grows us into the people God intended us to be. And we wonder why. Why don't we ever become the people that we read about in the Bible or that we imagine we could be? It's because we don't take the adventures that God intends for us to, to shape the people he's called us to be. And so as you go on these adventures, I want to encourage you. Stick with God. Take the dive. You know, jump off the cliff. Climb the mountain. God's going to develop you to be a person you never thought you could be. There's a... Um, a song, I remember the, the, the line in the song is, I want to be the kind of person that people write about. Live a life that people would say, that's worth emulating, writing about, remembering. In, um, in every nation, we have a saying um, for our missionaries. And it says, you know, there's, they, they use like the, the colors of the traffic light, green, yellow, red. And they always talk about the crazy traffic in Manila. And, and so they, they're saying, you know, when we go to, on missions and go into these different countries, there's many countries where it's like go, being a missionary there's like green light. You can go. It's easy to go to. Go, go, go do it. So everybody goes, green light, we go. Where there's a green light, open country, we just go. Where there's a yellow light where it might be difficult, you have to have some caution. It's kind of like people drive, right? When you see the green light, you go. When you see the yellow light, you just go faster, right? That's... <laughs> that's the, it's the Asian way to drive, an American way too, you know. So we go faster. So when we see a country and it's a little difficult and there's some caution, we just go faster. And then we see a red light. Some of us, we won't mention names, we go anyway. <laughs> We're just going to go, you know. And, and, and that's, the, we're just going to find a way. And that's the spirit we want to develop, is when God calls, we just go. I always remember driving through the, the back country of, uh, in Japan. We were visiting all these different uh, dairy farms and was with this old guy, old dairy farmer. And he, was dri he was driving us. And I don't know if he was you know, all there, but he was, he was a lot of fun. Uh, but he would drive, and he's, he's driving through. There's hardly anybody else in the road. You're up in, these, up in the mountains out in the countryside. And so every time you come to a, a, like an a, a intersection where they had a street light, most of them don't have lights, traffic lights. And if it was red, he'd just keep driving. And you just say, it's green that way. So <laughs> keep going, you know, it's like, okay, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't recommend that. So as a church, we're going to run into difficult times. We're going to run, you know, the church isn't called to be popular. Church isn't called uh, to be political. It's, it's not called um, to, to be just powerful in human terms or prosperous in human terms. What the church is called to do is to be about the purposes of God and his presence and so we go where his presence leads us. And we go where he calls us. And it may not be the most comfortable place, but it will be the place that, where God shapes us to be his people, to become the people of God. And as we start to become the people of God, place does matter. We're not about location, but location does matter. And that's why I said, God, God said, Jerusalem matters to me. It's my holy city. It wasn't the most popular place. It wasn't the most powerful place, but it's a place that God was calling them to. In fact, God continues to call us to that. Uh, Psalm chapter 122, verse 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. So God still says, Jerusalem is an important place. In New York, uh, we used to have a, a congregation in our church that was just, um, it, it was messianic, or it was all Jews who had become Christians. 
And so they held their services on the Sabbath, Saturday, and they did all these different uh, traditions from Jewish uh, religion. And one of the things they do every, every Sabbath, every time we gather, is they would pray for Jerusalem. And they knew where it was, the, the direction. So we'd all turn to where Jerusalem was, and we'd take time to pray for Jerusalem. Why? Because place matters. Location does matter. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 5 through 7, says, build homes. And this is Jeremiah talking to the, the people of Jerusalem, the Jews, even though they were exiled or expats living in Babylon. So for us who are expats living in another place, we still have an assignment from God. Place matters. He says this, he says, um, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them, multiple generations, so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare which will determine your welfare. So we pray for Jerusalem, the center of, of, of God's purposes here on earth. But we also pray for this place, Taipei, as long as we're here, we pray for this city. We want to be a blessing here. As expats, we don't come here just to get what we can out of it. But we come to see what can we put into it. And, it, and if you don't feel that way, begin to just pray. Say, God, recognize that God's put you here for a purpose. And that purpose is not just about you. But wherever God puts us, he puts us there to be a blessing. Okay? And so for us now, we're here in this place. We've been here for the past 15 years, Taipei, Tai Power, Gangwon, Shida area around. We're here especially because NTU and NTNU are here. And we know that God has called us to reach the next generation, especially focused on college students. And so we're going to continue in that. As we move, make this next move, we're going to keep a footprint here uh, over closer to the Tai Power uh, by Guting Elementary School. Um, and so we love this new place that God has for us. But we're also expanding it into the Songjian Nanjing area, center of the city. And we feel like God is, is putting us into these two places because both places matter. If we're going to have an influence in the city, we want to be central to the city. And God's plan is always expansion. Jesus said, I'm sending you to begin in Jerusalem, but don't just stay there. Go to Judea. Samaria to the uttermost parts. And so we started here, Thai power. But God is calling us to expand, not only in this city, but other cities, other nations. And, and I know we're small. We're just right here, you know. But every seed is small. And you can, you can count the number of seeds in an apple, to say, as the saying goes, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed. Because the potential that seed has for food and fruitfulness and influence is the same with every church and every believer. And when you stop thinking about just today and what I can accomplish and say, every day is an opportunity from God. Every day is like a new seed. It's an opportunity for influence, for sharing the fruit of God to be a blessing. There's no limit. Every day is like a new adventure to say, who's God going to bring into my path that I'm going to be able to influence today and plant a seed in today. Going back to our, 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 our theme verse here, the leaders of the people were living in Jerusalem. And so they had, to, they, they had to force people to go to Jerusalem. And I love how Kira says the leaders were already there. Because leaders go first. Leaders go while it's still the despised city. Leaders go while it's still undesirable. Leaders see the potential, and they lead others into it. And as a church, we want to be a church of leaders, people who see not just what is, but what could be. We want to start to begin, begin to be able to dream with God so that God can begin to work his dreams out through us. And that takes beginning to be able to see with the eye of faith and to see the way God sees it. So God looked at Jerusalem the broken down, despised city that people didn't want to move into even after the walls were built. And he said, that's the holy city. That's the place. And there were leaders who said, okay, God, I'm going to be there. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be alongside you in that place. And there is a call on Taipei. There's a call in Taiwan. Again and again, we hear it from, from people around the world saying, you know, there's something special about Taiwan. There's a reason why Taiwan is always in the news. And it's not just about politics. It's not just about military, and it's not just about chips. 
but it's always about the purposes of God. And there is a purpose of God written for this nation and for this city. And, and, and some of us will see that and say, God, I'm, I'm going to be in that place. God's going to call some of you to be here. And you're going to say, okay, God, I'm one of those. I'm going to be a leader who moves in. Others of you, you're going to get we're going to cast lots. And you say, oh, shucks. <laughs> I got forced to be there. And everyone's going to say, yay, thank you for sacrificing. I, say, I didn't choose. I didn't volunteer for this, you know, circumstance. I really wanted to go over there. Why did I end up here? How many of you wanted to be somewhere else and ended up in Taiwan? Anybody else? Anybody? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's, I know there's a few. You know, constantly we have people say, oh, you know, I wanted to go to China. Or I thought I'd be in Singapore. I really wanted to end up in Europe. I don't know how I got so far off and ended up here, you know. We were in New York City and enjoying life. And then we ended up in Taipei. And we love it. I mean, for us, it's great because we came here and we loved it. But some come here and they don't like it. And that's okay, too. Church in Israel, headed into the wilderness, they didn't like it. But it was their path to the promised land. I know that Joseph didn't like being in prison. But it was his pathway to the palace. God's got a purpose and a plan. Leaders are those who are willing to take risks and even make mistakes. I don't know if I've ever met a perfect leader. Every leader makes mistakes. But that's just part of leadership, and it's part of bringing people into new places and accomplishing God's purposes. The lot is cast into the lamp, but every decision is from the Lord. You might think it's chance, but God's in it. Jerusalem equals the church. How do we know that? We look in uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. Um, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for a husband. And then uh, Paul says this, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her the holy and clean, washed uh, by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. She will be holy and without fault. So the, the church is Jesus' bride just like the holy city. And we'll see more of those connections here. Becoming the people of God. Places matter, people matter. This is uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with, the body, with Christ's body. We are, we are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. So we come together from many places, many parts, this is going through these scriptures here throughout the chapter 11, some from the tribe of Judah, some from the tribe of Benjamin. Where you come from matters. Your family, what tribe are you part of? We, we like to break the church into connect groups and say, who are you? who's your tribe? Who's your people that you're connected with? I, I love this, this chapter. Actually, in, in this chapter, one of the most um, uh, profound things is that it mentions the word son in this one chapter 52 times because everybody is the son of someone. And it says, this person... And it says, this person, the son of this so-and-so. This person, the son of so-and-so. Because we all belong to the family, and the family we belong to makes a difference. And you have a natural family, and there's a reason why you were born into that family. And you have to ask God, God, what is it about this family that you chose for me? But then you also have spiritual family. And you're saying, God, who is my spiritual family? And, 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 he, and in this family, you got to ask yourself, who's your daddy? Who's your mama? Is there someone that you draw from that speaks into your life that helps to shape and mold who you are because it's important in all of our lives that we look to those who can help to shape and mold our lives speak into our lives correct us discipline us encourage us in those moments especially in our tough times call out our blind spots because we all have them but then we have to also do that for someone else so who are you allowing to do that? Who have you invited into your life to speak into your life? And do you regularly give them that opportunity? Because most people are, are courteous and kind. They're not going to just come in and call out your junk. You have to invite that. Okay? And then, and then it says some are priests and some are Levites and some are gatekeepers and some are servants. Everybody has a function. It's the body of Christ. Everybody has a function. Second thing, uh, third thing, presence matters. 
says about Revelation 21 about, about Jerusalem. It says, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Actually, this new Jerusalem has no temple because the whole city is the temple of God. And this is what Paul said in the New Testament. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the one Spirit of God lives in you? The new Jerusalem is this. It's us as a people creating a place for the presence of God. But even more than that, purpose matters. Because we have a purpose to have be a, a place where the presence of God dwells, but also then to, be, to let that presence shine through us. Revelation 21 verses 4 through 6 says it, 20, 24 says, By its light the nations will walk. And the kings of earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Can't wait till our hub becomes 24-7. Just people of God always there praying, seeking God, sharing, discipling each other. People coming in and out all the time. Never shut. You can always find God in his presence there. The Bible says this about, about us. It says, you're the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop. It, that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives life, light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. See, we're called to be like missionaries. To not only shine the light of God, but to take that light where it can't be hid. As a church, we're a city within a city. We're to bring the light of God to Taipei. We're also to send that light out. We're called with a mission. And our mission is this. Verses 3 and 4 in Revelation 21 says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's our purpose. To shine the light of God. And when people come to this place that they can find God. The God who will wipe away their tears. The God who will heal their pain. The God who will meet them in their darkest places and bring light. 1 Peter 2, 9 says it this way, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, our mission is Jesus himself. That we would carry his presence in us wherever we go. That we would be with him that we would become like him and that we would do what he calls us to do as individuals and as a church. What matters most and what makes us the people of God is that God is with us. When he's with us, we become his people and he is our God. Would you stand with me as we close? You know, in the months of uh, July and August, we're, we're going to go into a series on just what it means like for us as a church to go from being a, a mission filled where it's all about what God can do in us and, and through us and for us and begins to shift to us being a mission force where it's all about what God can do through us and who God can send us to. And in this congregation, we have a number of people here who are missionaries. And we're just going to go through a, a series where we just share what it's like to, to live like a missionary. But before any of that can happen, the first thing that has to happen is we, we need Jesus in our lives. And so I never want to close without giving an opportunity. Some of us, some of you, have maybe, maybe you've never invited Jesus into your life. You don't know what it is to have the life of Christ in you wiping away every tear, chasing out the darkness, healing the brokenness, comforting us in our pain. 
And so just bow your heads with me for a moment. Father, today, some of us, we, we've never experienced your presence in our lives. But Lord, we want to experience that. We, 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 we so hunger and desire to taste and see that you are good. And some of us, we ta we've tasted of it in the past. But Lord, it's been so long. And we're just saying, Lord, renew your goodness in us in this day. And Lord, for all of us, what we've tasted, what we've seen, we just say, Lord, we want more. We want more of you, Lord God, in our lives, individually and as a church. And so we just say, Jesus, come. And Lord, we, the, the things that have kept us back, Lord, we just take a moment, we repent of those things. Lord, you put your finger on the things that are coming between us and you. Lord, and, 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 and grant us the humility to repent of those things, to remove them from our lives so that we might embrace all that you have for us, Lord God, and taste and see more of your goodness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.